I'll begin in a few seconds, but I have to kind of scan the audience first and make sure my boss isn't here. <laughs> you say things a lot differently when your boss is in the room. And let me hang on just a little longer. I have to make sure none of my students are here. <laughs> and I'm, if they were here, they'd be a little bit embarrassed. I'm going to share this. People think I have a great job, right? I work here on campus, and I work with students, and we do all of the fun stuff on campus. We have concerts and movie nights and dances and dodgeball tournaments and all of this really, really cool stuff. But here's a little secret, and I'm happy none of them are here today. Working with student leaders absolutely sucks. It's like, <laughs> it is the worst job you can think of. I'd rather be an advisor with the people on Capitol Hill somewhere than trying to be advisor to student leaders because they're 16 to 25 years old. Some of them, they can drive, but you don't want to be in a car with them because it's absolutely scary. <laughs> Others are just old enough to vote, but if you talk to them, and the reason they decide to vote is because this candidate was more beautiful than the other. It's like, there's no reason to it. Some of them are old enough to drink, but they probably shouldn't be doing it, right? So this is the population that I work with. And they know absolutely nothing about what it means to be a leader. They really don't. I'm educated in, I have a master's degree in leadership, and there's a lot of principles and things that I try to teach. But when I first start working with them, they know absolutely none of that. So in some ways, my job sucks. You should all feel really sorry for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just that. It's uh, what I love about it, and I, I truly do love what I do, is that I get to work with some students who honestly don't know much about what it means to be a leader, but they're willing. And they show up, and because they're willing to show up, we get to do a lot of cool things. I mentioned I study leadership, and it's interesting when you think about the history of leadership and kind of what it means and where we began and where we come. It's a relatively new idea. Only about the last couple hundred years or so have you even heard the idea of leadership coined the way that it is. And even though we know so much more about it now than we did a couple hundred years ago, I think most people agree that we don't necessarily see better leaders. It's not like all of the knowing and the understanding that we have now has really produced better leaders. Right? Even when we think about naming leaders and people who've been really influential throughout our world, we always seem to go back in history and name people who most of the time are no longer living anymore. And my question as an educator and then one who works in academia is I'm always wondering why is that? Where are we missing the mark? And I'll take a few minutes to kind of maybe explore kind of what's happening and why we don't tend to see as many leaders now than we should, given the fact that we know so much about the topic and what is required to be a good leader. Thinking historically now, um, one of the first approaches that we kind of see to leadership is pretty Darwinistic, right? It was called like the great man approach, meaning that if you either inherited the crown or if you had some special trait, and I would be a good candidate because I'm extremely tall, right? So people would look at me and say, you, you be the leader. <laughs> You're taller than everyone. You could probably kick people's ass, so why don't you go out and do it? And then people started to have issue with that a little bit, the fallers in particular, because they said that although this guy is tall and although he may be able to kick people's ass, we're tired of going to war. <laughs> we don't want to keep fighting. We don't want to keep the, having this person get us involved in all of these different conflicts. So from there, people say, well, maybe that kind of Darwinistic approach or the biggest badass person being the, the, the leader is not the best approach. Let's think of something different. So what came next was kind of this idea of a, a behavioral or a situational approach, saying maybe you would do fine in war, but you're not so great when it comes to politics or, or something like that. So maybe we need to find the right person for the right situation or the person that has the right behaviors in a certain avenue somewhere. But that also had some issues, and we still see that somewhat today, but that also has problems because we live in a dynamic and changing world that's always going on, it's always shifting. And so every time it shifts, if you have somebody who's very, very good in only one area, what happens when the ground shifts underneath them, right? You have to find a new leader every time that happens. 
So we know that that approach, although better than the Darwinistic approach, is maybe not the best. So then we begin to think, okay, perhaps it's all about influence, <laughs> right? If you can win friends and influence people, <laughs> you can be the leader, right? Sounds a little bit better, and you see organizations begin to really, really grow with this type of idea because you can have somebody who's very charismatic, who can get up and speak and win friends, and it sounds like that's a good idea. But then the followers also say, well, what about us? Do we get to participate in this at all, or is it just about the figurehead and the person who's doing all of the speaking and the talking and standing up in front of people all the time? And a lot of times you'll see that the person with the influence didn't always use their influence in the best way. Anybody remember a leader named Hitler? <laughs> Perfect example. And I talk to students about this in my class that I teach, and talking about leadership, I, I always do this, and it's always fascinating what they say. I always say, was Hitler a great leader? And they, they break up in different groups, and they have to sit, and they have to kind of go around and, and discuss this idea. Was it overwhelmingly, and I shouldn't be shocked anymore, but I'm still shocked every time I see it, they all say, yes. And here is their argument. They say, well, he was influential. He was able to gather people to come to get them to come together over some complex issues and ideas. He led a nation, and you know, we kind of think that he wasn't a good person. We're not saying he was a good person, but we think he was a good leader. I'm like, ooh, that's something about that just never sits well with me. And then I ask another question. All right, you're all convinced that Hitler was a great leader. How many of you would have voluntarily have followed him? No, not me, no way, right? All of the hands go down and everybody thinks, oh no, I would not have voluntarily have followed him. So what's going on here? Why is it that you say that he's charismatic and all that and that makes him a great leader, but yet none of you wanted to follow him? It brings me to sort of the next approach of leadership is where we're kind of at today. It's this idea of reciprocity, right? Leadership is important, but we also understand now that followership, it's a newly coined word, but followership is every bit as important. We want to be able to voluntarily choose to follow our leaders or not. If you sign my paycheck, and I joked earlier about my boss being here, but if you sign my paycheck, if you have any sort of authority over me, real or perceived, if you can dictate my quality of life in any way, I'll follow you and I'll do what you say. I may give you the middle finger on my way out the door, but I'll do it long enough so that I can obtain what I want out of life, right? Does that mean that I'm truly following you, though? Does that mean that I, I like you in any way? No, absolutely not at all. And so I like this new idea and this framework that we're working from because at least it, it acknowledges that followers are every bit as important as leaders. And when we work with students, not just students, but in all of our organizations, we know that people kind of care now. They want to be involved in the process. They don't want to just leave it up to one person, some figurehead, to decide kind of... Uh, what type of quality of life that they, they get to partake in. They want to be involved in the process more, and I think that's a good thing. I think we're kind of moving in the right direction there. But I still don't think we're quite there yet. Um, because I feel like any time you have this idea of leadership, and even when it's combined with this idea of followership, there's still that dichotomy there, right? The whole orientation, I believe, is still off somewhat. This orientation that we have here, what we are experiencing here. I get to be on stage, you do not. <laughs> that means that I must know everything, <laughs> you must know nothing, right? I get to be the subject, you are the object. So why don't you just hang out for 18 minutes and let me tell you about my idea worth spreading, right? Because I'm the TED Talk. I'm the guy that you have to pay attention to. <laughs> and some of you are laughing because half of you are probably saying, well, who are you? Why are you qualified? Why should I listen to you? Great. You should be a bit skeptical. What makes me any better than you? I don't know. I feel like I'm pretty ordinary. Others of you, perhaps you acquiesce more. And just by virtue of my presence on this stage, you already believe that I understand or I know something that you do not. Perhaps I know a little bit about this subject because this is what I study. But does that make me necessarily in any way better than you? I think what happens 
oftentimes when we think about leadership is that we tend to focus on the extraordinary, right? Let's say that there's a spectrum on the stage. Ordinary and extraordinary is all the way over here. Some of us are inclined to say yes to situations, and we, we just want to get on that spectrum somewhere. Other people avoid it for a variety of reasons at times. But one of the most damaging things, I think, is that with this orientation that only a small percentage of us have all the answers and we know everything that's right, that that means that you don't get to participate. And I think that's, that's really damaging, and I think that causes some issues. I love the way that little kids kind of think about this. And um, my daughter, is, is she's, my, she's my leader these days. She's my, my best teacher. She's only seven years old. She plays basketball. I played basketball. And the neat thing about I'm old enough to where none of what I did, it was like pre-YouTube era. So I can convince her that I was the best player on the planet. And she can't disprove me. She thinks dad was Michael Jordan, right? <laughs> and so I'll watch her play. And it's absolutely amazing what happens when little kids are seven play. They don't keep score at all, right, at this age. And she, she'll come up to me after the game, she's like, Dad, did you see? I made three baskets, did you see that? And I'm like, yeah, but you missed 17 before you made three. <laughs> if you have a little kid, you've seen this, little basketball players are absolutely awful. Like the shooting percentages are just horrible. But what I love is that she doesn't focus on all of the 17 misses that she had. All she's excited about are the three baskets that she made. And I love that because I think that we've kind of got this idea of failure wrong, right? We think that we need to make 17 out of 17. We need to be on this extraordinary side, and yet we miss all of the opportunities along the way where you can just be kind of ordinary. The cool thing is I think we live in a culture that absolutely embraces the ordinary. I really do. And if you want to, I'll prove it to you. Try this. Go eat a, a ham sandwich and a pickle somewhere for lunch tomorrow, right? Ordinary, you do it all the time. You want to make it extraordinary? Post it on Facebook <laughs> with the hashtag yummy or something like that, and like 100 people will say they like it, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, something that's ordinary became extraordinary just because you decided to post it on Facebook. Another example, we saw a video of, of Sir Ken Robinson earlier. Have any of you seen his other talk, uh, TED Talk? Yeah, 25 million views. Yeah, 25 million, tons of views he had. All of the TED Talks combined have about 500, half a billion views, I think. Pretty cool, fascinating talks. There is a talk on YouTube, it's not a talk, it's a, it's a video on YouTube where this little boy bites his older brother's finger. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. What is it called? Charlie, Charlie bit my finger. <laughs> it, if you have kids or if you've been a kid or if you have something, you know that biting a sibling is the most ordinary thing ever, right? <laughs> it happens all the time. My kids do it to each other a hundred times a day. They bite or kick or push, whatever all the time. That one video has 660 million views. <laughs> Way more than all of the TED Talks combined. <laughs> the most ordinary thing that you can think of, Charlie bit my finger, right? We all know it, we've seen it, and it, it's hilarious, I get that. But it's just amazing to, to me to think that you don't have to be that extraordinary anymore. <laughs> you don't. And I think that's kind of a cool thing. I do. I really think that the days of having one person be the figurehead and kind of dictating life for everyone else, I think it's done. And I think that's not bad. My students always talk to me about, you know, we talk about the heroes of leadership. And we go back as far as they're like, man, we need just another figure. Like, we need Jesus and Gandhi and, and MLK, and that'll change the world if we had another figure like that. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we need that anymore. I think we can, all of us, even being kind of ordinary, can figure out ways to come up with extraordinary results, right? None of us have to take that on. I don't want that burden to try to be MLK. I don't want the death threats and all of that. But I can, I'm okay.
being ordinary. <laughs> I'm okay doing what I do. And all of the things that I do with students, it's amazing that the things that stick with me the most and things that I enjoy and appreciate the most about my work, absolutely ordinary. We're on spring break right now. Last week, these are just the basic interactions that happen. People notice all of the fun stuff that we do on campus, but the stuff that excites me the most is I had a student run into my office and gave me a huge hug and told me about an internship that she got, and I wrote a recommendation letter for her. And then the next day, a student came in, and he just wanted to sit down, and he wanted to talk about issues he was having with his girlfriend. You know, just teenage drama stuff. And I sat and I listened. I didn't have anything wise to say, but I listened, and I know that helped them feel a little bit better. And then I had a student come to my office last Friday, and he's off this week. He's going to get married. And he said, I noticed that you wear bow ties sometimes. Can you help me figure out how to tie it? I'm getting married, and I don't want it to look silly. I want it to look nice for my beloved, my bride-to-be. And we went into the men's restroom, and we hung out, and for about a half an hour, we played around with this bow tie. And he shared with me how much he loved her and how excited he was to be with her. And I got to kind of participate and help him make that day a little bit more special. That's what leadership is to me. It's not about one person trying to become extraordinary. If you want to know how to become MLK, ask someone else. I don't know. I read all of the stuff on leadership, but I don't get it. I do know how to help people. And I do know that's kind of the direction that we should be going. I'll end with a quote. This is from someone unknown. And I love that because it's fitting that this is probably someone who's just pretty ordinary. To know why to do something is wisdom. To know how to do it is skill. To know when to do it is judgment. To strive to do it best is dedication. To do it for the benefit of others is service. To want to help others is compassion. To do this quietly is humility. To get the job done is achievement. To empower others to do all of these things is leadership. Thank you.